Okay, so last day with me. Um, so I decide to, um, of course, talk a little bit more about MD and then introduce you to um, Monte Carlo. And then I'll show you uh, what um, is in the literature and what we have done about that so with the reference to combustion. And then I want to conclude with a um, couple of examples that are related to molecular dynamics that we've been working on just to show you the breadth of the application uh, for those tools. Um, and then I think it, it, I'll give you some time if you want to ask me some questions. So um, I, I'm not sure what the expectation were when you started this, uh, you know, Monday. Um, my goal was to give you um, an idea or uh, a tool that usually you don't see very often in combustion so that you can get some inspiration about, you know, maybe what you could do with that and maybe see if there is a way it could help solving what you're working on in different aspect. And I had various uh, students coming over and asking me, you know, if I have this system, what would you do with MD or how you would solve that? So I think that's uh, um, an important part of the story of this uh, um, week for you because as I was mentioning at the beginning, it's not about understanding all the details and how things work because that you can do by yourself. It's more to get exposed to different things. On the line of what has been said during the panel like an hour ago, um, I think it's important uh, always to know what other people are doing. Um, you know, even like you're a PhD student and uh, um, like you look for people on your committee or just collaboration, that's very important. And also meeting people, you will always find them at a conference, so it's important to be open-minded about stuff. And sometimes you find an answer in, uh, in a place that you were not looking for. Okay. I was mentioning again that I, I, um, I was not doing any of this during my PhD. Uh, so I was doing uh, some experiments. I was not very good at that. But, uh, um, and, um, and I did more, uh, some simulations, but they were not at this level. They were a different uh, type of simulation for combustion. So, um, just found uh, this because of collaboration with other people, and I think I found that this is some, what I like to do. So, um, also the other thing is that I want to mention is that those atomistic methods are not supposed to give you an answer to how much soot you produce in an engine. Okay, that's not the role of these uh, tools in this point. The role of these tools is to understand why or maybe the mechanism that drives those interactions. So if you have uh, that this fuel somehow is producing more nanoparticles, okay, molecular dynamics can help you understand why, what are the molecular pathways that drive those interactions. Okay? Then you need to translate this understanding into a different level that goes, for example, in a CFD simulation, and you see what tomorrow with the um, Dr. Chen, that what you need, for example, for that, okay? So here is really, you are going to explore different scale, molecular scales, how you translate a trajectory, what I was doing a little bit yesterday, into a property that could be useful, and eventually you have to transfer into a rate, okay? So if we talk about the dimerization, like yesterday, you don't care if the pyrene is rotating this way or this day, okay? What you care is a rate that eventually you can plug into the model that could be used even from you people in the industry, CFD, or anybody else, okay? So it's not going to give you the answer to how much soot. This is not a model for soot. It's giving you, with Evan, well, the first day I was talking about some of the models that are available in the literature, all the models have some parameters, okay? And so the role of this type of simulation within the context of nanoparticle suit is to give a science-based answer to those parameters. So it's not like one, but it is 1.2 because these are the molecular level. And those are important because otherwise, you know, the parameter, you tweak parameters sometimes. What, what this does is to uh, give you a solid base to choose some numbers, basically. Another way you can use those tools is uh, when you are interested in the reactions. So yesterday I was showing you uh, 
uh, that you know, if you have a molecule, for example, you can look how it evolves over time. So one thing that you might be interested in is that I have this weird molecule and no one knows what pathways you know, what are the reaction, the mechanism. So molecular dynamics, you can place this molecule, for example, at a high temperature if you're interested in pyrolysis and see how things evolve over time. So that's another way to use it. So I want to use three slides just to summarize what we did yesterday and then we'll uh, dive into the next part. Uh, as I was mentioning, I want to finish the MD as adding one more information that was the reactions we didn't do yesterday. All the uh, force field that we talked about yesterday were like a, there was no reaction. There was no bond making or bond breaking. It was like the dimer-dimer physical interaction of under valves. So let's go back to the basic idea. And uh, uh, as I was mentioning, MD is basically you solve the Newton equation. So you're in the classical approximation. You have your structures. You need, you need the, you know the mass, but you need information about the forces. Once you have the forces, usually you get from uh, the literature there are potentials. They give you the forces between atoms. What you do solving the equation with boundary conditions is to find the acceleration and the velocity over time. So how things evolve over time. That's a way to use MD. It's a dynamic process. And again, uh, the Newton for the motion of the atoms. I'll just keep this. Okay. And so the question we had yesterday was, you know, what do you need? You, you start with F equal ma, and so what you need is a force field, and to start you need the forces, so you need to find which one works for you, the position and the velocity initially for these things. And so let's see some, how you can use it. So, you know, this is a, um, an example. And this is a simulation, so you're not getting a number. I don't know if you see it but it looks like a space. And so this is, a, you're like a zooming into a box of a lot of attains with the nitrogen around. Um, and so just to see what happened inside the box, if you want. And the idea is that, uh, um, again, this is no reaction, but you can use MD, for example, to look at diffusivity. So one thing that we were interested in is the transport. If you have an heptane and now is a certain temperature in a bath of nitrogen, what is the diffusion of this molecule? Okay. So just an example. You can see all those heptane rotating. So all the, force, the uh, degree of freedom we were talking yesterday, so rotation, vibration, they're all taken into account. But this is um, an example of what you can compute. So from here, from an atomistic simulation, you can go all the way to a diffusion coefficient that um, you might be interested for your simulations. Or, as I was mentioning yesterday, movie, um, once you have a trajectory of your system, you can look at some structural information. So um, phase changes, you, in the left you see a solid, and the right is a liquid. So you have the same system, so think about, um, for ex the example was uh, ice, water, and eventually you increase the temperature, you get to the liquid if you want, and the peaks initially on the left are very distinct. You have the solid, nothing is moving, so you see the distance between the different hydrogen, oxygen. Once you have the solid, the second part um, it's more is a different phase, phase. And so what another information you can get from MD is the type of structures. So if you're interested, for example, in materials, or again, if you are interested in nanoparticles at high temperature in which there is a, some kind of melting or change of phase. This is another tool that you want to use for that. So I'm trying to give you an example of how to apply this. And just as a parenthesis here, uh, before I um, continue, I want to say that uh, it's also interesting to think about some what my students did. So my students, some of those went to academia. That's a straightforward. But other people, um, others, instead, they didn't. They want to work for industry. And just one example was one of my students who went to work for the um, LG company, the one that makes a cell phone and uh, uh, TV also. And they were interested in uh, having a, a film of polymer on the, um, on the screen, basically. And so what they wanted some simulations. And what they requested was molecular dynamics. So even if, you, if, if your job is maybe looking at combustion here, then again, you have a potential to do something a little bit different. Another project that we had with, was uh, with Toyota. That you know, if you think about that, it's so far away from molecules moving. But they were interested in um, um, 
So when you have a, a car in the winter, if you have a good car, you can uh, basically warm up the seats, right, in the car. And so the question for us was, if we had to add some nanoparticle to this fluid that you have, what nanoparticle would you pick and, and why? Okay. And so you transform this kind of uh, general question, like a bigger umbrella question, into an MD simulation, thinking about nanostructures, and then you compute the thermal conductivity of different structures. So we were looking, for example, at nanotubes and uh, how the thermal conductivity was changing with the length and diameter of those things. And so again, thermal conductivity is something that can compute also with MD. So even if you start from something general, um, one of the I would say one of the challenges, one of the ability that uh, I would like a student or something gain at the end of his training is also, um, you know, the, the these are skills to translate what he learns in different fields. I think it's very important for those things. Okay, so let me go back to the combustion synthesis. So we were talking about um, gas phase chemistry. We have some ideas, and again, you have a Professor Curry in the morning that is telling you how to develop mechanism. Those are only gas phase mechanism, and, uh, um, and that's the first part of the story. And then eventually there is this trans, um, transformation into some nanoparticle and more solid material. And so up to this point, there are two major um, school of thoughts in, uh, in, in, the, in the community to grow pH, so polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. One is more the physical clustering. So the example was if you have a pyrene, a pyrene, once you form those, the idea is that they will form a dimer, and dimer will live long enough to represent one of the nuclei on which other material will add, for example, or will keep growing, okay? And that's the transformation into nanoparticles, basically. The other, um, the other school of uh, um, thought is basically more the chemistry. And so saying that um, those pHs will still grow, but they actually they form a bond, a covalent bond between the, um, uh, the species. And so with the um, MD that I showed you yesterday, there was more a tool to see, you know, if I have the PA to pyrene, will they stick as a function of the temperature? And what we saw, if you remember a little bit, is that the bigger the, of course, the bigger you have the pHs, the more likely it is to form a dimer. If you remember, there's a free energy, so the spontaneous process is basically was negative when you added this oval in the circumference of big structures. But the downside is that the concentration of structures is not high. So even if uh, per se the dimerization process is uh, favored, then the concentration is relatively low. And so how often does it happen? That's you know, an important question to ask yourself. And then we talked also about, you know, maybe structure as a role. And so even uh, molecular dynamics can help you give you some suggestion about the role of structures. So if I have the same size of a polycyclic, but now I have a chain, what I was showing yesterday, then the ability to form a dimer is different than something without chain. So information about, uh, so again, if you want to make a jump from an atomistic simulation to a bigger scale that you use, then maybe in the rate for the dimerization, you consider the pHs with the, ta with the tail instead of uh, you know, a pure, um, fully condensed one. So the thing I want to briefly add is, uh, what about if you have a reaction? So yesterday we were talking about the Leonard-Jones. Leonard-Jones is what I show you here. There is no reaction. Um, but Interatomic potentials are very different. So you usually find all this in the literature, um, and the way they are um, presented is like uh, tables sometimes. You know, you say if you have a carbon, carbon, I don't know, an sp2 and sp3, this is the distance, this is the bond, this is the angles. Um, and so, how do you choose? First of all, what are the differences among all those potentials? And so the shape of the potential, so how they behave, this is different, whether you have a metal, when you have an unorganic material, if you have charges, this is all something that you take into account, how many parameters you need to fit, you know, to that. And lastly, and I think maybe it's interesting here, is the bond breaking. How many can break a bond? Only few, okay. And what I wanna show you is the problem here, why this is a problem. So, first of all, all bonds are not the same. And again, I'll upload all the slides, so sorry if there was not everything in the, in the um, binder that you got. 
So the first thing is that um, the bonding. So if you have, those are different type of bond that you can have. And so starting from something strong, you know, if you have, like in rocks, there's an example here. So I have an ionic bond on ceramics. Ceramics are very important uh, in material science, um, for example. And then you have a covalent bonding, you have a metallic bond. Those are all uh, kind of primary bond, very strong. And then you go to weaker bond, like hydrogen bonding, like water and water hydrogen bonding. Even in DNA, you have hydrogen bonding, right? So those are different. Some are weak, some are strong, but depending on the question you're asking, then you need to um, be able to describe all of that. And so example here, you know, Van der Waals, if you're thinking about wax or a spider silk for a hydrogen bonding or even DNA. So as you move down the, the, the column, the weaker uh, is the bonding here. Also, so what I have here is that um, the same bond is also, you have to be careful about the environment because, you know, if I have a, um, a potential, not all the bonds are the same. If you look at the top, in which the one that are um, exposed, for example, to the environment, there is a different strength uh, compared with something that you can have more inside or in the bulk. So, it's a lot of things. And so the way usually you describe a potential with this U, if you want, the energy, is the sum of all the contribution that I was showing you before. So usually you list all of them. And so you have a metallic, you have a covalent bonding, uh, you have a van der Waals, and other. so all of them. But then, for example, if this is an example for uh, a protein, you still have all of them, but when I go to the metallic contribution, it's zero. If you're, doing, if you're interested, for example, in proteins. And so here I'm listing some of the potential. There was a question someone asked me yesterday, um, what I recommend for some of the uh, materials. And so here I listed some of those, uh, you know, if you're interested in silicon, in copper, or uh, um, more, you know, biological system. Also, we go with charms. So it's different in case you were interested for that. Okay, so now what's the problem here? The problem is that those kind of potential are listed, you know, depending, you have a carbon, uh, if you bond another carbon and you have a, a sp2, sp3, um, that's the kind of uh, um, the, the information that you find. So, but what happens if you have reactions at this point? So this is uh, something that uh, um, if you have uh, on the graph what I'm showing, and the, sorry, the pointer is not working. But, um, use the, I use the mouse here. So um, if you have an sp2 and an sp3, you have those kind of shapes, right? But if you're having a reaction, what does that mean basically here? So if I look at this, this is working, okay. So look at this molecule. This is actually was one of the molecules for the surrogate. Um, two points in this uh, uh, movie. The first one is that a way to use molecular dynamics is, for example, you have these new molecules. Actually, we chose this molecule for a surrogate, um, of course, for jet fuels in the past. But the problem is that when you take these molecules, you don't know what's happening. You have some guess, but you do not. And so the way you can do, you can understand more is you take this molecule and you, for example, look at pyrolysis. You place in high temperature and you start seeing which is the weakest bond that breaks first, basically. And so here we'll see that this part, the, the last C and C will detach over time. So this is just a molecular simulation in which, you know, you have everything rotating. The, the reason, so it comes off, right? So you have an idea that maybe this is a reaction, a pathway, that's the way to use MD. And then what I will do next is to go to very high level calculation to understand the energetics and the rate of this. So that's the way to use MD, for example. But the point here is a little bit different because when you, you, when there is a transition, when you are breaking something, then your molecule, so if it's here, um, let's see if this goes down, no. Um, I cannot do this so slowly, sorry. Um, so if you look at the carbon here, they have some kind of bond before, and then during the transition, there is, a different behavior of the molecule. So if you go here, and now you have just, this is a cartoon, but you have a molecule, and you have, let's say, the purple is an hydrogen coming in, okay, something simple. Then the hydrogen is pulling um, away one of the two greens, and so 
eventually you have A here, then you have A bound to a B, and then you have something different. So if you look at the energetic of this, you know everything about A, you know everything about B because you have those two molecules, but what about in between? So how do you describe the transition? How do you describe this middle one here? If you just look at potential that are described as, you know, carbon sp3, carbon sp2, and the type of bond. So that was a problem. And that the great idea was instead to start defining this potential as a bond order. So here what you see is like a different type, for example, carbon, carbon, you can have an sp3 here, okay? Or you can have an sp2. An sp3, uh, like a methane or an sp2 ethylene, for example. And so you can have this one. Instead of listing them as sp3, sp2, sp, they came up with this idea of listing like a bond orders, basically. So is the number of uh, uh, chemical bonds between a pair of atoms. And so in, in case, for example, for acetylene, this, uh, uh, for carbon, carbon is three, if you want. Okay, so carbon has yeah, so two hydrogen and other carbons are the three. So in doing that, you change from the bond length, then you use the bond order, and then you describe the energy in terms of the bond order, okay? Instead of going from bond length to energy directly. So um, in doing so, you have a, um, um, a kind of a very nice transition in which you have the bond order able to match, the, to describe the sigma, the pi in your molecules um, without problems, basically. And so that helps you also with the transition in which you are having uh, a bond order change instead of uh, the length. So what are the key features of reactive potential? So the molecular um, is capable of describing chemical reactions that all the other things that I showed you before were not able to do it. Um, there is an energy landscape that um, during reaction, so that the, you can still can integrate the equation because it's continuous with it. And then there is no tags like sp2, sp3, but it's only on uh, the elements that you have. It's efficient because it is a, a finite range of interaction, and I'll show you an example in a minute. One of the most widely used that you find in the literature is REACTSFF. Um, and so uh, REACTSFF, um, and the way the total energy in this case is the sum of uh, um, various contribution from the bond, the van der Waals and the Coulomb that we talked about, but there are also something that is uh, energy over and energy under, but basically that means that they correct uh, the energy. There is a factor that correct the energy if um, there is a problem with the definition. So many people have used this in terms of the, the potential. And so I want to show you a couple of examples. So uh, this is what we talked about yesterday. So you have uh, um, UNMD. You're doing the same things now with the reactive potential. And so you have uh, the particle to position. You assign some velocity. Then you calculate the forces, move the particles, and then um, save the position as we talked yesterday. And then once you re reach the time step, you basically can stop the simulations here. So this is an example that is in the literature. So they have done a reactive molecular dynamics situation to study some of the soot formation. And um, basically, well, this is a, a list of the hydrocarbons. And REACTSFF considered the bond energy, so it allowed for the formation and breaking, as I was mentioning. And so they studied pH between 100 to 700 uh, molecular weight, temperature of 400 to 2500 Kelvin. And so they were looking at um, put it in a box, so what happened to that, basically? And so um, this is uh, the, the result. And so they identified three major uh, regions. So a low temperature, there was only physical nucleation, so there was no reaction between the bond. Then a uh, middle temperature, there was um, no nucleation. They saw some small clusters, but nothing. But when they went to higher temperature, the nucleation uh, was happening because of the chemical bond. Okay. So if you have this potential that is able to do not only the physical, but also in addition as a term for the chemistry, um, then you can kind of uh, um, describe a wider range of temperature and condition that you might be interested in. 
Um, they also look at the formation, of course, of the dimers, and they saw that the stacked were uh, um, sometimes stacked like this, but also in a T-shaped, so in this kind of position. And so this is the temperature here, and this is the mass um, of the uh, of the of the pHs that you were looking. So A2 usually is a way to describe a pH with the two aromatic rings. And so we go A10, A19 as a 19 uh, rings, basically, on this. Okay. And so what you see is that uh, um, the mass, the temperature here, um, the higher the temperature, um, this is the chemical, sorry, the blue. This is the chemical uh, nucleation that is in the blue here. Then there are stars for the no nucleation, and the reds are a physical nucleation, so no reaction is happening at this age. Okay, so that's a way to do that. Okay, so that was the last uh, quick information that I wanted to give you about MD that we didn't discuss yesterday. So now you have an idea of uh, how to deal with MD if you're interested. You can um, describe your system, be careful about you know, some of the parameters, and then depending on the, your system, what you're interested in, you can choose uh, reactive or non reactive uh, potential here. But you still have a problem with trajectories, right? So if I go back to what we were talking about yesterday, you have a trajectory, so you have a, but how do you translate this into property that is more macroscopic? And so the definition we came up yesterday, where there is this basically, um, this kind of probability density distribution, so not all the states are the same, basically. Um, this is impossible to carry out analytically. And so what basically we have talked about yesterday is that uh, um, you have to solve numerically. And there are two ways to do this. One is molecular dynamics, as I showed yesterday, and the other one is basically Monte Carlo. So just to remake the point, if I have a temperature that evolves like that over time, you know, which one do you want to pick for your system? Which one is the answer that you want? And if you remember, when you talk about individual microscopic state, they are not enough. You cannot have one trajectory and give me the answer to everything in here. So going back to this equation, and if you remember, we were mentioning the ergodic hypothesis, so the ensemble, average is going to be equivalent to the time average. That was the, one of the hypotheses we had yesterday. And so um, um, what you see here is basically this is the average of uh, this property over the ensemble and is equivalent to the average of the property of the time, basically. And um, if I do molecular dynamics, I average over the time steps. That's what we were talking yesterday. Okay, and so it's a dynamical information that you have. If instead you average over Monte Carlo steps, then you can describe this property using this kind of approximation here. Okay, and so there is no dynamical information about this uh, um, the solution that we have here. So. Um, a couple of basic understanding of Monte Carlo, and then uh, um, I'll show you how we've been using that. So uh, basically is uh, to, the need to find a convenient way to solve again this integral that we were describing already yesterday. And so what we did us is to use the idea of random walks, and so to step through relevant microscopic states. Okay, and so create some kind of a weighting factor for the states that have been visiting, the probability if you want. And so this is just a, a very simple example. And so Monte Carlo over a domain. So let's assume that you have um, this kind of a domain and you have a size of one in this case. And so what you want is uh, uh, the integral over this domain of uh, your property. So for example, if you're interested in the area of the circle, you know, that's the value of a pi. And so um, what Monte Carlo does is a stochastic, and so is a playing, like a playing dart. And so randomly select points into the domain, basically, and evaluate the integral at this point, so some of those, and then sum the result to solve the integral, basically. Some are inside the circle, some will be outside the circle for that. And so what happened is, if you do this a step by step, is the first one, you pick random um, a point okay, in, in this domain. Then you accept or reject 
this, uh, this uh, value, this criteria. So for example, whether it's inside or outside the circle, so you can accept the number or not. And if, uh, um, if it's in the area, you get counted. If it's not, it's not counted. And then if you accept it, basically, you, do, um, uh, you, you sum the total of what you get, okay? the, the function that you're interested in. So you, there is a, a random uh, identification of points, and there is a criteria that you use to accept or not accept. What you the number that you get, and so what happened is that you go from something that looks like this all the way down to um, this kind of expression. So, though where n is basically the attempts made by your simulations to compute um, this f of x here, and things might be also a little bit more complicated because this was a simple thing. So you have a circle, so it's easier for you to define you know, what is inside, what is outside the circle. But things could be more complicated. You can have different shapes. But up to this point, I'm only talking about the space. So you are jumping in space, right? What about now if uh, we want to look at the evolution of the system dynamically from a state to state? So. Look about this. Uh, this is a sum that you are familiar now with. Um, this is a, like well, a potential energy, for example. And so, if you have your system here and eventually wants to go here, the question is, what is the probability to jump over the barrier to get here, right? Or if you are on this state, what is the probability to go down to something that is very, very stable here? When you look at kinetics, when you look at reaction that happens here, um, what you really care, right, is this one, EB. So this barrier, the height of this barrier that you need to pass, basically. So jump, um, uh, the jump over the barrier occurs um, by thermal activation. And so you can define a probability that is function of this activation energy, if you want, okay? So, if, uh, in this case, I wrote that the probability is proportional to the exponential of uh, um, activation energy KBT. So KB is the Boltzmann constant. So that was it. Now, if you define, so I'm trying to bring the kinetics into the story of Monte Carlo here. So now, if you define uh, the event frequency as function of this W, for example, as a function of the temperature, so basically it's equal to the probability. The jumping, right? So you are in a specific state, you want to know if you will jump or not. That's what it is. So the kinetic Monte Carlo algorithm works like this. And I can see if I have that. So um, basically, what ha in the beginning, so you have a Monte Carlo simulation, and so we consider a system with a, a set of transition. So think about um, all the reaction that can happen. That's a possibility. Your molecule is here, and you know they can do uh, 10 different things. So you have a list of probability, W. So the idea is that uh, what is the probability to go from the state where I am right now to some other states? So at the time zero, from a list of rates, in this case, the possible reaction that you have, um, possible reaction, so you calculate with this function that is called R, and is the sum of all the rates available in the system um, at that moment. And so, and, um, and then you get a random number usually. That's the way the, 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 uh, the algorithm works. And so in this case, it's U between the zero and 1, and you can generate them. And so, and then find the events that uh, um, this random number has generated and carry out the process, basically. So you carry out this event i, and then find the probability, and recalculate now all the reactions. So um, just to simplify this, so let's say that you have your molecule here, OK? And you know that, let's say, at t0, initially, um, you have a series of species around, OK? And you know I have a list. You know that benzene will react. You have a rate, R, A with A. You have a reaction with B, and you define RB. And then you have a possible reaction with RC, OK? So this is the list of all the probability that you have, the transition that can happen. You define this R, uh, this big R, as I was mentioning there, that is the sum of all the probability. And then you pick um, a random number to identify or to draw randomly the event. And so then, for example, let's say that you pick C. And then the second step, you are here, and maybe you added C here, okay? 
So now the, 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 different, the list will be different. You can still interact with A, you can interact with B, but this is now your starting point. Okay, so you jump in space from this configuration to this configuration and use a kinetic rate as um, the probability, basically, jumping over the barrier. So uh, here, this is a cartoon, but just to tell you how you do that. Um, so if you have, let's say I have three species, okay, three probability. Now, if I have, uh, instead of A, B, and C, I have R1, R2, and R3, and I just gave you some numbers, so 0, 1, 0, 3, 1.2. So you have three transition rates. So this guy can react with three different things. What you do, you compute this uh, R that is defined uh, as the sum of the rate. So R1 is at 0 0.1, so it up and out. R2 is 0 0.4, so you have 0 0.1 plus 0 0.3. And then R3 is 1, 2 plus 0, 0.3 plus 0, 0.1, so it's 1.6. It's the cumulative function that you do. And so then if you basically, um, you consider um, a random number generator, so U, and you split your interval here, as you can see, so R1, will happen if the number R is between 0 and 0 0.1. The second reaction will happen if you are 0 0.1 and 0 0.4, and then the third reaction will happen 0 0.4 and 1.6. So you have this U random generator and um, basically select one of the reactions that can happen, okay? So if you want a reaction two to happen, for example, your U times R needs to be between 0 0.1 and 0 0.4. Right, and that means that basically is proportional to the rate. So the rate of R2 divided by R. Does this make sense, what I said, a little bit? So it's a way to move um, with a stochastic method in which really what's driving the, what the, the event that you're going to pick is driven by the rates that you have. So you already see here that uh, one of the inputs that you need to Monte Carlo, kinetic Monte Carlo, is the rates. You need to know um, R, A, B, and C. So you need to know something about your system before you decide to move. To move. So here I listed a little bit, uh, maybe it's too crowded, but um, I can summarize those. There is also a couple of references. Um, and, so they can, the, the interesting part is that, uh, uh, first of all, it could be used, um, it, it works with the rates, okay? There's nothing to do with the thermodynamic. So you don't need to be thermodynamically. We are talking about this yesterday with MD. You can have reaction that, you can have species that here do not exist, and they exist here. So this benzene with the C attached is not present here, okay? The time step that you choose for this, uh, um, for this jump, basically, is a function of the available rates that you have. So you can deal with the new species that are formed. Doesn't matter if this comes in at the big, during your simulations. You can have um, uh, different rates that you can deal with that. Doesn't need to be, uh, to, and you can have species that disappear. So sometimes, you know, that, I don't know, you break the benzene, for example, and you have now two different species, different from water. So it's very, is uh, highly flexible for these things. And also, um, you know, if uh, you have a, um, a slow object, so one of the, the, the things is that the delta T that is used to jump is a function of all the possible events that you have, right? And so even if you have, like, for example, three very fast events, the delta T is going to be small. But if one of those is going to be very long, for example, the delta T will take into account also that. So it's flexible enough that basically um, is able to um, take into account the different velocity of the rates that you have in the system. So when you look at uh, uh, what people have been doing with this, so they took this idea, and uh, one of the, uh, briefly I want to mention with the KMC, they, uh, this is Kraft, and he is a professor at Cambridge in UK, but also at Singapore. And in 2008, uh, they proposed a suit model that described the particles by the aromatic structures, okay? So they were thinking about uh, an example of the pH structures that you can um, have as a different configurations, right? So you can have a pHs, so a look at this, is only six member rings, okay? But you can have what they call zigzag site, you can have an armchair, you can have a free edge site, and you can have a base site. 
So similar to what I showed there, this is, so is taking the seed and there is more complexity, right? There is a different structures that you can have. And so what they did, they defined a list of possible reactions that you see here in gray in the paper. But basically this is a probability, is something like those RA that I was mentioning here. So you see an example for, uh, um, a reaction which you start from this one, maybe, and you jump over those processes to close to pyrene, okay? So you have a list of possibility that can be applied to your system. And so um, what they did was basically to grow those structures according to this different rate. And again, stochastically. So you have the rate, you have some idea about pathways, and then you let the system uh, move and grow in size. That was very interesting, this, uh, but um, still, it, it's, uh, it, it's um, it, you know, you have six member rings, you can form also five member rings. But um, of course, it's great, there are some limitations because you don't have the whole variety that you can have with aliphatic chains, but this is a, a nice way to see the application of Kinetti Monte Carlo to combustion, for example. And so, again, you don't know, you have something that looks like this, like a big thing, and you don't know how it grows. You can go with um, molecular dynamics, again, weight over time, or you can basically do a Kinetic Monte Carlo in, that allow you to jump in time. Um, so reach also processes that could be longer uh, than MD. Right, because the delta t again to go from here to here is function of the rate. So if there is a slow rate, the delta t will take into account that. And so you can go from something that is very fast, but also you can go to millisecond in principle with the Monte Carlo. Okay. Frankelec is another one that really did a lot of work uh, with the, uh, Monte Carlo, and what he was interested in there was. Uh, um, the role of five member rings in the migration. So if you have a graphene layers, so in soot, the, from nanoparticle to soot, eventually you become more graphitic. You lose all the hydrogen. You're left with the carbonaceous material. And so what he was interested in is a surface of soot, how the five member rings can basically move around, and if they move around. around. And so are constantly the idea being formed on the growing edge in, uh, um, want to look at the kinetics. And so basically, um, another example of this was same, similar. You have to provide a list of reactions. So here is a table from the paper, but um, uh, the idea is that, um, you know, you describe events that can happen. And then statistically, again, with Monte Carlo, given the structures, given those events, you can see how they grow, okay? Um, yeah, for this system, you know, if you're interested, this is the paper, but you saw the 42 transformation in the model, so that was uh, um, very interesting too. Um, another way to use Kinetic Monte Carlo in this study, because we are all trying to understand how things grow. That's the question, basically. Still with the six member rings, uh, um, they were growing with the Kinetic Monte Carlo, assigned a certain type of reactions, and what they saw that in some cases you start forming those kind of uh, curvature uh, species with the curvature also. And the last one, again, from Frank Luck is that, uh, um, uh, uh, was 2018 actually, and now he has a list of reactions that include 111 uh, possibility, in which he's also including some oxygen. And the idea is similar to the same. I have a, a list of possibility, I have an event, I need to apply those to my system to see how they grow. Okay. So, um, with some idea of MD and Kinetic Monte Carlo, then let me tell you a little bit more about uh, what we have done in this area. Um, so, uh, maybe I'll give you the break. Um, so, my interest is here, has been in here for a long time. And uh, remember the cartoon I showed you at the beginning? Um, in the moment you want to keep track of those molecules, then you have a problem. You have a problem because here you are the species, now you have a gas phase distribution. So you don't want to jump directly to a nanoparticle that is a sphere, but actually I want to go this way. I want to see how they realistically they are growing inside. So I want to see how many carbon, how many hydrogen, how they look like in this. And so in the moment you have this 
coupling of time scale, um, there is a problem or there is a, a challenge. That's maybe a better word. So this scale is like a millisecond. You keep growing. But on the other side, once you have this kind of detail, then you can have um, rearrangement. So, you know, the molecule, as I was showing you, like the five member rings, it can move on the surface. So you are growing because there is chemistry coming in, in a small species. So you have your benzene, let's put it this way, but you have gas phase species that are interacting. At the same time, on the edges, on the surface of this molecule, you can have something else happening. And the time scale is completely different. So this completely much faster, for example, uh, sorry, the time scale could be longer than having uh, a rearrangement on the molecule, like a fine member rings moving around, which sometimes they are like microsecond or picosecond reaction. So the question was, how do you bridge these uh, um, time scales at this point? And so um, this, the beginning of the story was a few years ago, is uh, um, thinking about MD, as I show you up to this point, in which if you plot the length and you plot the time scale, MD can only take you to up to a certain point. So it's great for uh, this time scale, but if you want to go to millisecond, for example, that's the time scale you saw, then it's not, um, it, it's not the answer at this point. The other, of course, the other extreme was the continuum. So you can go farther in the size and uh, in time, but then uh, you're losing the um, atomistic details. And so that was not what I was interested in. And so in the end, we come up with a combination of this uh, kinetic Monte Carlo and molecular dynamics. That was the initial uh, effort in this area. And so the idea of uh, somehow bridging those two was um, the solution to the problem of this uh, time scale. M uh, Monte Carlo was used to jump, like a big jump in space. And MD was, the initial idea was to use more to see at this a smaller time scale in which you have a rearrangement on the surface. Um, so um, I think I'm going to stop here. I have to give you the break at three, and then I can start over from here with uh, my Monte Carlo technique. Okay.